I'm going to invite you to take your seats and uh, turn in your Bibles or your Bible app to the book of Judges, chapter 6. Judges, chapter 6 is where we're going to be for our Heroes series today. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 242, and you will find Judges chapter 6 right there. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, before we dive into the message, let me just give you an update on our Thunderbolt painting project. Uh, this past week, we started painting the, the junior high school. They had 40 classrooms for us to paint, 40, 45, something like that. And we've got uh, two-thirds of that project done. We had 87 heroes show up this week and uh, work on that. Yeah, give yourselves a hand because that's awesome. They're going to be uh, finishing up Monday and Tuesday. So if you were hoping to, to help out or planning to help out, then you can still be there at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday and Tuesday uh, as they finish up. Wednesday is kind of a, a check-in before you show up because they're, they might be there to clean up and, and everything like that. But I just want to say thanks. I, I love being a part of a church that, that cares for the community, invests in the community, and, and does these incredible projects for the community. So thanks uh, for helping. And if you were one of those 87, uh, I'm especially thankful. If you haven't been there yet, uh, don't worry about it. There's this week, and then there's the big project in October that we're going to be leading as well. So uh, just put that on your calendars. So we're continuing our Heroes series. And, uh, and if you're like me, you don't naturally see yourself as a hero. You know, I never wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and go, you're a hero. <laughs> it just, it's just not what, it, what I'm thinking. And that's why I love today's hero. This guy named Gideon is who we're going to be looking at. Uh, but before we look at Gideon's life, I want to set the stage. Um, Judges is a time in the, the nation of Israel where they're a new nation They've conquered the promised land, they've settled it, uh, but they have no formal governing structure at all. I, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a tribal thing. Uh, they, you know, they have the 12 tribes of Israel, which are clans, basically, and so they settle in an area, and, and uh, they were, each one had their own area, and then they kind of operate as family groups in those areas. So there's no real structure, there's no organization, there's no military, anything like that. And, uh, and, and then what happened is the people got comfortable and they kind of forgot the things that they were taught about God. Because there's like, everybody doesn't have Bibles and stuff like that. They, they basically have the Ten Commandments uh, and the law, but only the priests at the tabernacle have that and read that. Everybody else just gets told what to do. And so what happened is over time, they, they start noticing how their neighbors, who aren't the Israelites, are worshiping other gods, and they start worshiping other gods, specifically Baal and Asherah, which were fertility gods. Uh, they would have sexual rituals to try and get uh, those gods to give them harvest and grains and things that would grow and, and everything. And, uh, and of course, that's breaking the Ten Commandments. That's you know abandoning the living God who brought them out of Egypt and so then God allows other nations to oppress them. So in Gideon's time, there was this nation called the Midianites that were a nomadic people that kind of would move in and steal all their grain and all their animals. And uh, after a number of years, the Israelites started, you know, remembering that God delivered them before. And so they start crying out to God to deliver them again. By the way, this is kind of a historic pattern for hundreds of years. The Israelites would do that. They would... They would uh, you know, defy God, they'd worship other gods, God would punish them by sending another nation, they would cry out to God, God would deliver them, and they'd turn back to God for a little while. Kind of like us, right? You know, we do really good for a while, and then we screw up, and then we cry out to God after things go wrong, and, and God heals us. So, so the Midianites are oppressing the Israelites, the Israelites pray for help, and God sends our hero Gideon. We're going to pick up in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, the first thing we see about Gideon is that Gideon was a nobody. Gideon, our hero, was a nobody. Beginning in verse 12, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. 
And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Uh, Gideon was a nobody. So God shows up, and Gideon uh, is hiding, actually. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. He's doing it so the Midianites don't find him and steal his food. And uh, God shows up and calls him a mighty warrior, a man of valor, if you will. That sounds like God being sarcastic a little bit. Uh, and Gideon says, God, uh, you got the wrong guy. Surely you're mistaken. Don't you understand? My clan is the weakest in this entire tribe of Manasseh. In other words, we're the smallest, we're the least significant, we don't have influence. And I am the youngest one in my clan, so I'm the least important person in the least important clan in this entire tribe. Are, are you talking to me, God? Are, are you really talking to me? Gideon says, I'm a nobody, I'm insignificant, I'm unimportant, I'm weak. You ever feel like Gideon? You ever say, God, how can you use me? I'm a nobody. See, honestly, this is why I love this biblical account. I can relate to Gideon. I'm, I'm the third of four boys in my family. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I was just kind of the, the afterthought so many times. You know, my older brothers, you know, they got to ride up front. I, I, I never rode in the front seat of a car until I got my driving permit. Because <laughs> the oldest got to ride up front. So I was just saying, you know, most of the time I was in the back of the, way back of the station wagon facing the wrong direction, which does not work. <laughs> When you get car sick easily. Um, so, you know, that was just part of life. I, we moved a lot, so I was always the new kid. And so I didn't have all those friendships that, you know, uh, people grew up with. And so, you know, on the playground, I was not always, ever the first one picked. You know, I get to high school, and I wasn't an outcast because I wasn't actually important enough to be noticed. I was just kind of invisible. You know, I was the classic nobody. And, and, and so... I don't know, how many of you kind of were nobodies? Anybody else? Good. We got, we got some nobodies. We should have a nobody club. Uh, and uh, nobody's left out. Uh, but see, here's the thing. God loves to use nobodies to be heroes. God loves to use nobodies. Think about it. Scripture tells us that God chooses the weak to confound the strong. God chooses the foolish to confound the wise. He doesn't care if you're a nobody because God likes to take broken, insignificant, unwanted, unequipped people and use them to do amazing things. That's, that's who Gideon is. He's the classic nobody, and God uses him. So Gideon was a nobody, and the second thing we see about Gideon was that Gideon was afraid. Gideon was afraid. Look down at uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 25. And by the way, yeah, you should read the entire account of Gideon. I've, I've just got to hit pieces of it. Chapter 6 through 8, it's a cool story. Uh, I hope you go home and read that. Verse 25, chapter 6. That night the Lord said to Gideon, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold, here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So if you're afraid, God still wants you to be a hero. Gideon had a face-to-face -face encounter with an angel who told him, you're the guy that's going to deliver Israel from this other army. And then God gave D Gideon detailed instructions about what to do. I mean, I want you to tear down the, the altars to the false gods. I want you to build an altar to the living God. I want you to sacrifice a, a, a bowl on it for me. And, and Gideon was afraid, so he boldly obeyed God in the middle of the night. I mean, think about this. He was afraid of his own family. He was afraid of the people that he'd grown up with in this village. And, and yet he, he still is terrified of what they're going to say. And so he does it under the cover of darkness. Now, they got up in the morning and honestly, the guys in the village wanted to kill him. 
And his dad kind of said, hey, guys, if Baal wants to, you know, defend himself, let him do it. So Gideon got a nickname uh, that went along with that. But uh, uh, here's the thing. God is calling us to be heroes, to boldly obey him, and some of us are afraid. Some of us are timid. Some of us are unsure. And Gideon is proof that God is okay with you being afraid. But he's not okay with you using fear as an excuse for disobedience. You see, if God has told you what to do, then do it. It's interesting, uh, because I love hearing people's stories. And, and, and if I have a chance, I'd love to sit down with you and hear how God has worked in your life and how, how he's done amazing things to bring you to this point of faith and life change. And, and I love that. But then I see fear when I look at somebody and say, you should tell your story. We want to hear your story. Can I do a video testimony with you? And then people suddenly, their eyes get really big and they're like, like no, I don't want to do that. And, and, and so here's my, here's my plea to you. If God is doing amazing things in your life, please don't avoid me. Okay, I want to hear the stories. And, and, uh, and at some point, we may ask you to, to tell your story. And, and uh, so just you start praying now about it. Listen to God and obey him even when you're afraid. So Gideon was a nobody who was afraid, and Gideon was full of doubt. Gideon was full of doubt. Judges 6, beginning in verse 36. It says, And Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the flesh threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When Gideon rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, there was enough water out of it. Uh, he wrung enough water from, uh, dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me, let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let the fleece be dry, and on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. <laughs> so if you've ever wondered where that uh, fleece, putting out a fleece illustration comes from, it's from this account. It's from this story. Uh, God has clearly and miraculously communicated to Gideon. He, he had said, hey, uh, here's what I want you to do, and here's what's going to happen, and Gideon doubted, and he needed affirmation. A and so God affirmed himself and his plan to Gideon four times in this account. You read the whole account, 6 through 8, and you're going to see. First of all, there's the, the angel encounter at the beginning when he tells Gideon what he's going to do. And then there's the, the, the fleece twice. And then right before Gideon does the attack, he, he goes down and listens to people describing how Gideon's going to be used of God for this victory. So God keeps doing it over and over and over again because he wants to affirm Gideon in his obedience. So if you're here today and you have doubts, you're in good biblical company. You are. It, it, it's, it just understand, it doesn't matter if you're questioning God's love for you or God's existence or the you know, historical reality of Jesus or the accuracy of the Bible or the relevance of Scripture. We, we get that. God understands. And here's the thing. If you will obey Him, He will prove to you that He's real. If you'll obey Him, then God will show Himself. Now, what happens is a lot of us want God to prove it and then we'll obey a lot of us go, God, if you show me, if you do it, then, then I'll follow you. And what God is saying is, follow me and I'll prove it. Obey me and you'll see my power unleashed in your life. And, and see, we look at Gideon and we think, well, you know, God proved it to Gideon. But Gideon, you know, even though he doubted, he never stopped following. Even though Gideon doubted, he kept moving forward in obedience. And, and that's kind of the... The, the way that God wants us to. He wants us to keep following in obedience. And here at Calvary, we're not afraid of your doubts. If you're struggling with stuff, then I really want to encourage you to sign up for Summer Life. The whole focus is hard questions that people ask. And the pastors are going to be teaching, and you got a chance to, to interact and dialogue and talk about it. So uh, I encourage you, especially if you got doubts, sign up and, and check it out. Because here's the thing. We know if you trust God enough to follow... God will prove himself to you. If you trust God enough to obey, he's going to show himself real in your life. 
So our hero Gideon was a, a fearful, doubting nobody. And Gideon was crazy obedient to God's insane plan. Crazy obedient to God's insane plan. I want to pick up in verse 19 of chapter 7. There's a lot, a lot of stuff I'm skipping over. I'll go back and fill in some of the, the details in a minute. So Gideon and the 100 men who were with him came to the outskirts of the, the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies, 300 men, blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. Uh, God's battle plan for Gideon was insane. Okay, this is like the original suicide mission. And, and, I, and let me give you the perspective. The Midianite army had 135,000 people in it. So 135,000 is the number they got to fight. Gideon sends out a call to the, the members of his clan, of, his, of the uh, tribe of Manasseh, and 32,000 men show up. Okay, that's a 1 to 4 ratio in case you're doing the math. And, and you're outnumbered 4 to 1, and God says, Gideon, you have too many people. If you guys go to war with 32,000 people, everybody's going to say, look how great you are rather than how great I am. So tell everyone who's afraid to go home. 22,000 men leave. Now it's Gideon and 10,000 Marines. Because uh, they're not afraid, right? And God says, you know, now you're outnumbered 13 to 1. Uh, you got too many men. I don't want you getting the credit for being a brilliant, you know, genius on the battlefield or anything like that. Uh, so take them down to the creek, have them get a drink, and, if, and everyone who drinks a certain way, I'm going to tell you to keep, and everybody who drinks differently, you send home. After they do that, Gideon is left with 300 men. Think about this, 300 versus 135,000. God says, that's enough. Now, this already sounds crazy right now, and, and Gideon's probably thinking, God, do you have like a nuclear weapon for me or something here? Even this out, maybe machine guns or, you know. No, here's, here's God's strategy now for Gideon. I want you to divide the group up into three groups of 100. I want you to surround the Midianites. Okay, think about that. It's like, you know, the people in this room, we're going to go surround the city of Lake Havasu. So surround the camp, and, and here's what I want you to do. In the middle of the night, I want you to have a pot, a torch, and a trumpet. A pot, a torch, and a trumpet. Oh, my. And I want you to break the pot and hold up the torch and blow the trumpet. Basically, make some noise and then light yourselves so they can find you easily. <laughs> okay, this is the craziest battle plan ever. And Gideon and 300 men are crazy enough to obey God, and they go and surround the camp of the Midianites. They make a bunch of noise. They shout for the sword of the Lord and Gideon, blow their trumpets, hold up their torches, and God causes the Midianite army to go nuts and kill each other. That's God's battle plan, and it works. By the way, that's the original 300, in case you are a fan of the movie about the, the battle of Thermopylae and the Greeks and the Persians and stuff like that. Uh, understand, in, in historically speaking, Gideon had 300 guys. The Greeks, they had like 1,400, and they all died. Gideon had 300, and they all lived. Because God is greater. And Gideon was crazy enough with his 300 men to let God use them to defeat a massive army. Jesus' followers are called to a life of insane obedience. Guys, we're called to a life of insane obedience like Gideon if we're followers of Jesus Christ. So if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you have already said, Jesus, I'm going to do the crazy things that you ask me to do as your follower. Because you've already called him Lord. You've already said, hey, you're my Savior. You're the one who's forgiven me. I'm going to live your way. In other words, 
Jesus is kind of asking us to be like Gideon and leading 300 men against 135,000. He's asking us to be crazy obedient to his insane plan. So here's what I want to do. I want to point out just five crazy requests from God of his followers. There's more than this, but I just want to point out five. And I want you to think about these. And I kind of want you to give yourself a crazy test. Okay? Are you, are you crazy faithful? Are you heroically faithful to God? And, and in, in some of these, the answer is going to be yes. And some it's going to be, hey, I need to work on this. And some of these, you're going to go, hey, God and I need to have a conversation because I'm not being obedient to his insane plan. So here's just five insane requests of God that he makes of all of his followers because he's calling all of us to be heroes. Matthew 5, Jesus tells us to love your enemies. Love your enemies. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now look, it's hard enough to love our neighbors, but Jesus is actually asking us to love the people who are trying to hurt us. And I know immediately everybody wants to go geopolitical and think about nations. And no, I'm talking about personal. Jesus is talking about personal. Who are the people that are trying to hurt you? Who are the people that are trying to ruin your business? Who are the people who are trying to be your detractors personally? In other words, when I talk about enemies, whose face pops into your mind? And Jesus says, I want you to try and build their life up rather than to harm them. Here, let me just use the Apostle Paul's words. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love is patient and love is kind. So are you being patient and kind toward your adversaries in life? Toward the people who want to harm you? Whether they be in your family, or whether they be at your office, or whether they be just the neighbors down the street that are really annoying. Or maybe it's your ex. But see, this is Jesus' strategy to conquer the world. And it's crazy and costly to love like Jesus, but that's God's battle plan for a victorious mission. Love your enemies. Second insane obedience that Jesus calls us to is to serve others to be great. Matthew 20, 26. Jesus is talking to his disciples because they're arguing about who's going to be greatest. And he says, hey, look, in the Gentiles, they lord it over one another. That's not how we're going to be. Whoever wants to be great among you must be the servant of everyone serve in order to be great and this grates against our selfish souls doesn't it because our natural inclination is to want people to take care of us to wait on us to serve us and yet jesus says if you want to be great serve think of others first think of others before yourself so are we crazy enough to make serving others a priority for our lives not just something we do occasionally Not just an event we attend, but as a day-to-day existence, we're going to think about others first. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the more that Calvary serves the community of Lake Havasu City, the more influence we gain in Lake Havasu City. Uh, Have you noticed that? It's kind of a cool thing. The same is true in your life if you'll trust Jesus. After all, Scripture tells us over and over and over again, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that He can exalt you in due time. We spend so much energy trying to promote ourselves, trying to get recognition, trying to advance our own careers, our own lives, and Jesus is saying, I will do it for you if you will trust me and if you'll be a servant. But it's crazy. It's it's an insane plan for career advancement, but the question is, do you trust Jesus enough to do it? Third insane request that Jesus makes of his followers. Acts 20, 35. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's better to give. Now, this is so easy for us to believe with our children and our grandchildren. Anybody like to give gifts to their children or grandchildren? Yeah. A lot of hands go up. You like it on Christmas when you're giving out those presents and those little ones are opening them up with eyes of delight and you love giving them a gift that they love to receive. That's a whole lot better than the lame stuff we give each other, right? I mean, once you're, once you're an adult, it's kind of like, yeah, you buy the stuff you need yourself. Who needs more socks? It's like, oh, gee, what's in this box? Anyway, so we know it's better to give than to receive. We like that. We believe it with our children and our grandchildren, but do we believe it when it comes to strangers? 
Do we believe it when it comes to tithing? Oh, I know. There's a lot of you sitting here right now going, it is crazy to think about giving 10% of my income to God. That is nuts. You're right, it is. And God doesn't flinch in asking his followers to do that. He's like, hey, I gave you everything. Give it back to me. Let me prove to you that I'm faithful, that I'll take care of you. After all, Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. The measure you use will be measured back to you. This past week, I, I got to be at the Zona Youth Camp, and I was the pastor to pastors. I was teaching adults. And I had a lot of conversations with leaders, uh, both in groups and in uh, one-on-one. And one of the questions a lot of them ask is, hey, you know, what's going on at Calvary? How do you guys, you know, uh, grow a church in Lake, uh, in Lake Havasu City? How do, you, how do you see God working like that? And one of the things I, I challenged them on is generosity. I said, hey, Calvary is all about generosity. We give over 20% of our, our budget to missions. We give thousands more away in our community to people who are in need and help. Uh, and I just talk about some of the generous things that we do along with the serving pr- pieces of it. And you know what a lot of them say to me? That's great, but we can't afford to do that. Our church can't afford to be generous. And you know what I say back? You can't afford not to. You can't afford not to. I mean, come on, if you believe God and you teach this word, how can you afford not to be generous as a church? And if, as a church, we trust God's plan to bless us through generosity, can we do that as individuals? To trust God's plan, it's crazy, but it's his plan to bless us through generosity. Fourth crazy request that Jesus makes of us, bless those who persecute you. Romans 12, 14. The Apostle Paul actually says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. You ever had anyone attack your character, slander you, you know, say nasty stuff about you, oppose you, whether it's face-to-face, behind your back, or on Facebook? Uh, You know, that's a terrible feeling. Because all of us immediately want to defend ourselves, we want to attack back. And God wants us to be fountains of blessing even to the point of blessing those who harm us. Think about that. If we can do this, if we can bless our enemies, if we can bless those who are hurting us, then we're probably going to be able to bless the people who live in our household. We're probably going to be able to bless our friends and our family and the people we work with. Because words matter. Words matter whether they're in person or through text or on Facebook. And how crazy would it be for us to stop spewing anger at at those that we disagree with on social media and choose to bless people instead? Do you think that might represent Jesus better? The fifth insane request is to forgive as you've been forgiven. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So here's a a question. How many of your sins did Jesus forgive when he died on the cross? All of them. them. Scripture actually says the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us, purifies us of all our sins. So if Jesus forgives us of all of our sins, how many of the sins that others commit against us are we supposed to forgive? Oh, yeah, the the response is always less enthusiastic with that question. (laughs) We love the fact that Jesus forgives us of all our sins. We're not so enthusiastic about forgiving others who have hurt us. And yet, this is the insane request that Jesus makes. So why are we harboring resentment? Why are we holding grudges? Why are we refusing to forgive and letting bitterness poison our souls? What if we just poured out mercy on the people in our lives? What if we offered grace to our spouses? What if we offered forgiveness and mercy to our children, to our parents, to our coworkers? It's crazy, but it leads to amazing victories. You see, Jesus' followers are called to a life of insane obedience. We can choose to be heroes like Gideon and be crazy obedient. Or we can go on living in fear and captivity and oppression. See, I don't know about you, but this nobody wants to be a hero. What decision are you going to make?